tonight, uh, I want to uh, look with you at a topic, uh, a message that I've entitled, To Wait or To Act. Uh, to Wait or To Act. There are many situations, well, we're going to start in, in Genesis 12, so you can open up to Genesis 12. Um, I'm going to mention a couple Psalms before that, but we'll put the Psalms on the screen. But Genesis, you have to look in your own Bibles for that. So, but there's many situations that require us to make a decision. Uh, changing jobs, careers. Uh, should I wait or should I do it now? Uh, maybe entering into a relationship. Uh, maybe uh, serving in a ministry or maybe starting a business or starting a ministry. Maybe selling or buying a house um, or moving to a new city. All of, all of these different decisions, um, sometimes we should wait and sometimes we should go for it. How do you know what to do? Uh, maybe you have on your heart that you have to have a tough conversation with someone. You're concerned about the timing. Should you initiate that conversation or should you wait and see if they initiate it? All of, all of these situations are really questions of timing. You know, maybe your heart's being stirred about something and you're not sure, should I step out into this? I'm afraid maybe if I move too quick, maybe I could find myself uh, getting ahead of the Lord and my, maybe my needs aren't being met because I quit my job and I wasn't supposed to or, or whatever it might be. And if you wait too long, maybe you're afraid you're going to miss out on an opportunity. So do you, do you step out? Or do you wait? And when you do wait, how do you know when to move into something? When do you take action? When do you go for it? So let's talk about waiting on God. What, is, what does that mean, waiting on God? Uh, waiting on God is a time of preparation where you're patiently looking to God for his guidance. And the key word there, patiently. And, and you accept the timing that God proposes that God uh, has for you. Uh, so waiting on God can have this atmosphere of excitement, expectation, God's going to move. And, and also with it, there's this realization that, well, my own judgment, I really need to, to listen to the Lord here and exercise that. Uh, waiting on God, we see that it's, it's commanded in scripture. The, the Bible has a lot to say about waiting on God. Uh, waiting on God requires courage. See, sometimes we think of waiting as just being lazy, just not doing anything. Watching TV or, or not taking action at all, you're just complacent. That's not what the Bible has to say about waiting on God. Waiting on God, in fact, takes courage. Uh, Psalm, uh, Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait patiently for the Lord, be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Now, when you think of bravery and courage, you think of going into battle, going up for a fight. But here, this, 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 this uh, verse says, I'm going to wait on the Lord, and I have to be brave. I have to be courageous. I'm going to wait on the Lord. Uh, if any of you have ever been through a season of waiting, anybody ever been through a season of waiting for something? I think probably everybody and for those that haven't raised your hand, I know you're just so exhausted <laughs> that you didn't raise your hand. But waiting on the Lord can be exhausting, can it? It can drain you. It, it can be a time filled with tears. Uh, that's what Psalm 69 verse 3 says. I am exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me. Anybody relate to that verse? My goodness. And then, of course, waiting just implies, obviously, patience. Uh, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. So courage, perseverance, exhaustion. Uh, waiting is not a time of idleness. It's not a time of laziness. Waiting is not just sitting around and doing nothing. Uh, Peter Marshall wrote these words, Teach us, O Lord, the discipline of patience, for to wait is often harder than to work. To wait is often harder than to work. Before we go any farther, let's pray and ask God to bless our time here in his word. Father, we do come before you. Lord, some of us here are in a season of waiting, and it's gone on longer 
than we thought it would. Some of us here might be in a situation where we feel like you're calling us to step out, that the waiting is drawing to a close. Lord, but we're not sure about the timing. Pray you'd speak to us, Lord, and give us wisdom. Lord, we do love you. We pray for the men's retreat that's coming up, even tomorrow, God, for all the guys that are going to be going. I pray you'd really use this time to uh, strengthen them and encourage them, to equip them for the battle that, that is raging uh, in many of our lives and in our culture at large and in many homes. Father, I pray you'd use this, these next few days to, uh, as you strengthen them in, that then you would strengthen uh, the children and the grandchildren and the marriages that they represent, Lord. And Father, we pray um, that you would refresh us. We pray for the children across the hall. We pray for the youth Pastor Julio, Lord, thank you for uh, this next generation. Pray you'd strengthen and encourage them. Lord, there's, there's many needs represented here. Lord, we commit all that into your care right now as we turn our attention to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we talked about waiting, but let's talk about stepping out in faith. Stepping out in faith. And by stepping out in faith, I'm talking about taking action, executing a decision, going for it, putting your hand to the plow, so to speak. Talking about moving forward. Uh, If you're a Bible reader, and I know many of you are, if you're a Bible reader, you know the Bible's a book of action, isn't it? It's about God's people doing God's things. Uh, Joseph working in Egypt, uh, saving an entire population, God's people leaving Egypt, Think about Elijah and Elisha, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Think about Jesus constantly on the move and the Apostle Paul and Peter. There's there's a lot of movement in the Bible, a lot of exploits. Jonathan, uh, there's a little uh, obscure little passage where Jonathan, uh, who's David's best friend, the son of King Saul, uh, but Jonathan saw saw the enemy there, the Philistines. He had his friend, his armor bearer with him, and he saw these enemies of God and he said, he said, hey, let's go down and attack them. Let, let's just go for it. Let's go and attack them because God can save with many or with few. God doesn't need a whole army. He could just use us. And his armor bearer said, do whatever you have in mind. I'm with you, whatever you want to do. And it's a venture of faith, stepping out in faith. And so we talk about, well, what about David killing a giant, you know, going for it? He didn't wait on the Lord for that. He just went and he killed the giant. So many battles and adventures and relationships. Roth and, uh, Roth and Boaz. <laughs> Ruth and Boaz. <laughs> but all these ventures of faith, all these relationships, all of this, this action, people starting things and, and standing up for righteousness, confronting evil. John the Baptist was in prison because he was, he was talking, uh, he, he was exposing the evil in his culture, but that the king was engaging in all this immoral activity and, uh, and John the Baptist was speaking out about it. We need more John the Baptist today, speaking out about the evil in in our world. And and we see the Holy Spirit coming upon people uh, to to do stuff. Isn't that a great word? Just doing doing all of this this God stuff. Elisha killing false prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all these people confronting sin. And so so the Bible is a book of waiting on the Lord, yes, but it's also uh, the true account of God's people standing up and stepping out and moving forward. So how do you know what to do? Do you wait on the Lord or do you go for it? Notice that this question presupposes a calling, a promise, or a desire. Whether you wait on God or whether you step out in faith, it presupposes activity. A calling, a promise from God, a desire. If, there, if, there's, no, if there's no calling, if there's no promise that you're processing, if there's no specific desire that's in your heart, then this really isn't even an issue. Uh, you know, the, the Bible isn't an account of, 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 you know, just being home watching TV and not doing anything. Everybody you read about in the Bible, there's, there's stuff going on. The Bible's about God's plan for the world, and I'll give you a hint. Uh, there's two things, two activities that God is concerned about. And these, uh, under these two activities, you can, it, you can put everything that you or I would ever do for God. Evangelism and discipleship. Evangelism 
is spreading the gospel. Discipleship is facilitating spiritual growth. So every relationship that you have with anybody at all, the goal of that relationship is either evangelism or discipleship. Now, I don't, I don't mean in discipleship, I don't mean, you know, buying a book and doing a book study through somebody or these formal classes, although that, that can be discipleship. But your relationship with other Christians should be to encourage them and help them grow spiritually. Uh, I'm married, I have three kids, and I'm discipling my wife. I don't mean that in a kind of a weird way, <laughs> you know, I don't sit down and, you know, preach at her or, or, or things, but... But I, I help her grow. And, you know, she disciples me too, really. She probably disciples me more than I disciple her. And she doesn't even know it because I learned so much from her. But my children, I, I want them to, to grow with the Lord and to go on with the Lord. So discipleship or evangelism. So that's, that's our activity. When I'm around here with our staff, I'm always thinking about, well, try to always be thinking about discipleship, helping people grow. How are you doing? When I ask somebody, how are you doing? That's discipleship, because if, if I find out they're not doing well, I want to help them do better. If they are doing well, I want to rejoice with them and encourage them and exhort them. You see how that works? Evangelism and discipleship. And so uh, if, you're, if that's not on your radar at all, um, this question is not really appropriate. Because often when we think of like waiting on God, we might be thinking, I'm waiting on God to give me something. Well, why would he give you something? Why would he give you something? So that you can use it for discipleship or evangelism. So that you can pass it on to others and help others. He's not going to give you something so you can have a more comfortable life. Go into all the world and make disciples so they can be comfortable. And bless. Now, there's blessings. And God you know, wants us to be safe for the most part. But the Bible is about God's plan for the world. It's the, it's, it's the account of men and women that have been called by God to move forward with God's plan. And so if, if you don't want to partner with God's plan, then you don't have to worry about waiting on God for anything. You don't have to worry about whether you should take action. You need to worry about the state of your soul. All right, but I think for most of us, though, we're, we're concerned about God's plan for the world. So we need to step out of our selfishness and say, okay, God, what do you have for me? And so, so maybe we're wrestling with a calling. Maybe we have this promise from God, this, this desire to do something. All right. So uh, I, I'm glad for all of the individuals in the Bible that we can look at their lives and learn from them. Paul wrote, in, uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church that, that the things written in the Old Testament were written as examples for us. And uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to look at a couple episodes uh, from the lives of Abraham, Moses, David, and and then we'll wrap up with Paul. Abraham, Moses, David, and Paul. Now, I could do this with almost any person in the Bible because almost anybody in the Bible had, had a, a, maybe a season of waiting and then a season of fulfillment or stepping out. Uh, but let's start with Abraham, and that's why I've asked you to open to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 is such a critical chapter in our Bibles. Uh, it really goes, the Bible in Genesis chapter 12 goes from being a, uh, um, a telescope looking at this big picture to a microscope coming down and looking at one man and one family. And the Bible's interested in the genealogy of Jesus. That's why you'll see these genealogies kind of stop, but then one genealogy keeps going, and it's the, it's the genealogy of Jesus. And so uh, the character of Abraham, and, and these are all true stories. It's not, it's not a, a, par a parable or it's not a hyperbole or anything like that. It's a true story here. And, uh, and, and so, so Abraham, this promise here to Abraham, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Um, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Okay, so what, what's going on here? Uh, this is the promise that God gave Abraham. Uh, and he's, he's mentioned Abram here. Uh, I, may use, I may interchange that with Abraham because his name was changed later. So uh, it's the same person, just two different names. Uh, but God had told him to leave his house, move to a different land. And then God gives him this astounding promise in verse 2. I'm going to make you a great nation. 
Now, if God's going to make you a great nation, what do you need? Children. Right? You need, you need people. Uh, and, and, uh, and back in this day, people had lots of children. The only problem is Abraham and his wife were barren. They had no children. How old's Abraham here in this passage? 75 years old. Right? Not too many people have children when they're 75 years old. Some of you are saying, thank God. <laughs> Okay, so, so here's a promise. So this is a promise that Abraham gets from God, and then there's also a command uh, um, where God says, he's, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. In you, all the families of the earth uh, will be blessed. And the command is, is to get out of your country. Move away. Go to this land that I will show you. Uh, and so, so this begins the, a long season of waiting for Abraham. Uh, it was, now, God fulfilled this promise with a, a boy named Isaac 25 years after the promise was given. Think about that. God said, Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And it was 25 years. So Abraham, the, the story of Abraham, we see two warnings uh, that, that possibly we need to be careful of if we're in a season of waiting. Uh, the first warning is a warning of discouragement. It's easy to get discouraged. When, uh, when you're waiting a long time for God to do something. I've been waiting a long time for God to do something. There's somebody I've been praying for for so long, waiting for them to be saved, and they're not saved. And it's easy to get discouraged. Uh, but if you flip over to Genesis chapter 15, I um, want you to see this. Genesis chapter 15, uh, verse 1. We don't know exactly how long this was past Genesis 12, uh, but it could have been, you know, maybe 10 years or so, 5, 10 Years, we're not really sure. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abram. Now, why does God say do not be afraid? It's really easy. Because he's afraid. God says don't be afraid because he's afraid. Uh, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. I'll take note of this. Don't miss this. Look, look at Abram's response. Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Now, do you see what's happening? It's like Abram didn't even hear anything that God said. Why? He's consumed with this thought, like, I don't have any children. Who's going to get all my stuff? Abram was very wealthy. He had very, very much, a lot, lot, of, lot of wealth. So who's going to get all my things? Eliezer, my servant? And then it goes on in verse 3. Look, you've given me no offspring. <laughs> it's your fault, Lord. You've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And um, so he's discouraged. Now, God knew he was discouraged, and so God shows up. You know, back, back then, it wasn't like today where, where we can just open the Bible and hear from the Lord. So it, it, God spoke to Abraham, but rarely. And here, then, uh, God knew that Abram was discouraged. And so he comes to Abram and says, Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your reward. You don't need children. I am, I am everything that you need, Abraham. I think Abram's really saying, God, you, you said that I was going to be a father of many nations, but, but I'm starting to doubt if that's true. His waiting, his, his attitude that, of expectancy, of posturing himself for God to move, it had morphed into doubt. Now instead of waiting on the Lord, he's doubting. He started believing his doubt and doubting his beliefs. But we need to believe our beliefs and doubt our doubts. Don't make the mistake of doubting your beliefs and believing your doubts. You should doubt your doubts because they're doubts. And you should believe your beliefs because they're beliefs. Abraham's waiting had morphed into doubt. And so God reassures him in verse 4. No, no. Uh, and notice it says, the word of the Lord came. This one shall not be your heir, 
but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven, count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, so shall your descendants, descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So it was the word of the Lord that lifted Abraham out of doubt. God said, look at the stars. Your descendants are going to be that numerous. And, and this is a real promise. And so, so Abraham continued to wait. Uh, Warren Wiersbe, one of my favorite authors, said this. Uh, Waiting is for me one of the most difficult disciplines of life. Yet true faith is able to wait for the fulfillment of God's purposes in God's time. But while we are waiting, we must also be obeying. So the second warning that we get from Abraham, not just a warning about discouragement, but a warning about getting ahead of God. Getting ahead of God. Uh, Look at Genesis chapter 16. Um, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar. She conceived. When she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. And so God promised that he and Sarah would have a child. God reconfirmed this promise multiple times. Abraham believed that. But here now he had another lapse of faith. And he took matters into his own hands. See, at the suggestion that that Abraham gave, or the suggestion that Sarah gave Abraham, Abraham should have said, no, dear. The Lord said it's going to be our children from, from, from us. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go into anyone else. But instead, he had a lapse of faith. And, uh, and it, this horrible idea and the, the results were dis- disastrous. Listen, I don't want to get ahead of God. I don't want to get ahead of God. I want all God has for me, but I don't want to make anything happen of my own accord. Because whatever you make happen, you have, to, you have to deal with the consequences of that. And we can step out too soon. And we can get into the flesh in our excitement. We can mess things up. We can try to accomplish the spiritual with the arm of the flesh. Galatians 3.3 3 puts it like this. Are you so foolish? After beginning with the spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? So we get saved by the spirit, but then we get into the flesh and we try to make all of these things happen. Listen, we need to learn to walk by faith. Walk by the spirit. The beauty of this story, the beauty of Abraham, is that God did not sideline him. God did not set him aside because of his mistake. Abraham messed up, but God was still going to fulfill his promise, even though he messed up. Yeah, there's some consequences to deal with. But if you've messed up, I don't want you to be discouraged. Uh, If maybe you feel that you've let God down, uh, maybe you feel God's let you down, uh, and so in your mind you can't recover from that, but that's not the case. Abraham messed up, had lapse of faith, fell into sin, did wrong things, but he recovered and God still used him. That is such a beautiful aspect of who God is. So no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, uh, God can still use you. Uh, Maybe you've operated in your own strength, you've disregarded faith, you've said no to the Holy Spirit. That can change right now. Uh, With the help of your brothers and sisters in the Lord, you can just get right back on track. And so when we, when we come to Abraham, then the application that, that we can summarize here, his, his life, is this. Uh, waiting is a test of our faith. Especially when we mess up, keep believing. All right. In spite of any setbacks, God's not done with you. Okay, let's, let's talk about Moses. Uh, Moses had an incredible experience. Uh, lot, lots of, there's a lot of different episodes in Moses' life that we could look at. Um, uh, so, so Moses um, was a person that God raised up to lead his people out of slavery. God's people were in slavery in Egypt. They were, uh, slavery is wrong. It's abusive. It's, 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 it's terrible. And uh, God doesn't want anybody to be a slave. And, and so, so he raises Moses up to go into uh, this corrupt government and, and get these people out of slavery and set them free. That's a good calling, isn't it? Do something about the oppression. This monumental government abuse of power. He's going to go in and he's going to fight this tyrannical authority. And Moses is successful. 
and, uh, and they escape. It's a fantastic story. Uh, we'll pick it up in Exodus chapter 13 as they're leaving Egypt. Uh, there's one situation here that I want you to see that, that is just, just delightful. Uh, Exodus chapter 13. Notice how, notice how they're being led. Uh, when they're when they're running away from Egypt, it says, "Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt." So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses, uh, we don't need to read that verse there. Let me see verse twenty. So they took their journey from Succoth, encamped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went before them by a pillar um, to guide them, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, etc. Uh, so, the, so they're wandering around. They didn't go the direct route is the point. They didn't go the easy way, the highway. They're wandering around. God purposely led them on the back roads, if you, if you will. Um, and, and, and it gets worse. Verse, verse uh, 1 of chapter 14 now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp near Pihahiroth between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will save the children of Israel. They're bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Now, listen, we don't, we don't know exactly this route. If you look at a map or a Bible atlas, it'll show you different possibilities. But nobody knows exactly for sure where these different places were. But clearly by the text, in verse 3, when it says, Pharaoh will say they're bewildered by the land, the wilderness has closed them in, tells us that they were, they, they had, they were circling around and, and it looked like they were confused and they, they, were, they were blocked into a place that made no sense. Now, of course, a, a big world powerhouse like Egypt, they would have envoys all throughout the area making sure that no spies were coming in from other nations. So some Egyptian uh, military minds would have seen what's going on. Word eventually gets back to Pharaoh and says, hey, they're just wandering out there like clueless. They have no idea what they're doing out in the desert. And Pharaoh's like, let's go get them. Let's bring them back here. Uh, okay, so now think about this. They're backed in a corner. There's a sea there. They're lost. They're confused. There's an army coming for them. And they start complaining. You can read that in, 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 uh, later in chapter 14. They're saying it would have been better for us to die back in Egypt. They're, they're really having a, having a tough go of it. And look at what Moses says in verse 13. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still. Oh, could we say wait instead of stand still? Isn't that what waiting is? Standing still. Don't be afraid. Wait and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you'll never see again. No more forever. I love verse 14 of Exodus 14. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The NIV says the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So what can we learn about waiting on God from this passage? Well, if you pay attention to the text, the person speaking in verse 13 and 14 is Moses. It's not God. Moses is speaking to the people. Moses is a leader. Uh, and, and he's in a crisis. His people are in a crisis. Um, they're having a tough time. And Moses spoke into them God's heart. Moses cried out to God. Uh, you see that in verse 15. It says, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? So Moses is crying out to the Lord. He's speaking truth to the people. He's speaking God's heart to the people. He's waiting for deliverance. Uh, but he was powerless. <laughs> he, he was absolutely powerless to do anything. Uh, Andrew Murray, some of you might know who Andrew Murray is. He was a, uh, in South Africa, he was a preacher, a, a writer, and a, a church leader in South Africa. I love this quote by Andrew Murray. The great secret of a right waiting upon God is to be brought down to utter impotence. Being brought down to utter impotence. You have no power to do anything. Nothing, nothing Moses can do. God's got to come through. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is waiting on God 101, or maybe, maybe it's actually 201 or 401. You're, you're, you're in the school of waiting on the Lord. And it's like, God, unless you show up, we're done. 
Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the deliverance. And then God tells him what to do. Why do you cry out to me? <laughs> oh, if I was Moses, I'd probably get so mad at God. What do you mean, why do I cry out to you? What do you... <sighs> Tell the children of Israel to go forward. God loves getting people out of impossible situations. And, uh, and so Moses raises his staff, and of course we have the famous story of the parting of the Red Sea. While sea parts, God's people go through. All right, so do you see how, how they waited on the Lord, though? And, and they're in a crisis, and they're waiting for God to do something. They're not being complacent. They're not being an idol. You know, all waiting is is being a good steward of your current situation. Uh, and and you're, you're waiting for God to provide clarity. God, what should we do? Waiting is doing everything I can to seek the Lord. It's not passive. There's no difficulty with God. We feel like we're in difficulties, but one old Methodist preacher said there are no difficulties with God. Difficulties wholly exist in our own unbelieving minds. And so, how, how did Moses know when it was time to move? God showed up. He was just at a place of desperation and God showed up and there were no other options. And then, and this will help us too, if you look at verse 17 and 18, uh, and uh, I have the New King James here, it says, so I will gain honor. Other versions say, I will gain glory. Verse 18, it says, when I have gained honor for myself. So God's interested in glory. God's interested in doing something that honors him, that he is honored. So when you're thinking, if I step out in faith, is this going to bring honor to my Lord? If I step out in faith, is God going to be glorified in this situation? And so when we, uh, when we think about waiting and, and Moses, here's how I've summarized this particular episode. Uh, waiting is a test of our leadership, especially in a crisis. And we keep obeying. We just wait for God to say something and, and we move. God will show us what to do. Okay, uh, a couple more. Let's go to David. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. David was a shepherd boy. Uh, we don't really know how old he was when Samuel anointed him, but he's the youngest in his family. All of his older brothers were king material, or so you would think by looking at them. Uh, but uh, David, some say, was, could have been as young as 10 years old, 10 to 15. And uh, uh, God was fed up with the current king. And, uh, and so he sent the prophet Samuel to go to Jesse's house. And uh, Jesse brings all his sons before him. And, uh, and God tells Samuel to wait for David. David's out in the field taking care of sheep. And, uh, and Samuel anoints David as king. The only problem was there already was a king. Something's wrong. It's already a king in the land. How could David be a king? He's only, he's only a little kid. Look, I, I know what 13, 14, 15 year old boys are like. And it would take a word from God for me to anoint them as king. I'll tell you what. They're amazing, though. My kids are. Um, okay, so, so God, rejects, God rejects the king Saul, anoints David king. And I would think that at that point, David would march right to, to the throne and say, Hey, God's anointed me as king. Get out of here. But that's not what he did, interestingly. It was up maybe 13 to 25 years or so before David actually became king, waiting. God's given you, you are the man, you are this future king, but you have to wait. What did David do while he waited? Killed a giant. <laughs> protected flocks of sheep. Led worship in the palace singing songs to the king so demonic spirits would leave. He did God stuff while he's waiting. He developed a best friend, Jonathan, that would encourage him in the Lord. 
He provided community for those who were discontent in debt and distress. He did God's stuff while he waited. Uh, in 1 Samuel 23, there were some thugs that were looting a community uh, called Kela. David and his men went there and saved the community. He's fighting for, for, he's protecting the weak and the poor in his land. He saved a lady named Abigail who had an idiot for a husband. The guy wanted to kill David after David was protecting him. And, and uh, um, so he helped her and ended up marrying her. So the point is, while he waited for God to fulfill his promise to him, he occupied. He kept busy. He did stuff for God. So what do you do while you wait? Do you just pass the time? Or do you do something? So David's story tells us that the anointing comes before the position comes. David's story tells us um, that... Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me share this with you. Uh, David, in this situation, is a picture of integrity. Now, once he became king, that's another sermon. But before he became king, um, he practiced integrity. In fact, waiting on God is going to be a test of your integrity. Here's how it happened with David. 1 Samuel chapter 24. I'll just summarize what's going on here. David's on the run. Uh, the king's trying to kill him. Uh, king Saul had 3,000 soldiers. Talk about a manhunt. They're hunting for David. And David's hiding in a place called En Gedi. Specifically, he's in a place the Bible says is called the crags of the wild goats. So David's in the crags of the wild goats in a place called En Gedi, this desolate, rocky region. And uh, David and his men are in a cave. You ever been caving? Into, into these deep caves. And David and his men are far back in a cave. And uh, King Saul, well, let's just be polite. He had to relieve himself. And uh, he went into the cave to do it. I think, I think it's the King James or the New King James says he had to empty his bowels. <laughs> so he had to empty his bowels. And so he goes into the cave, the same cave where David is. Except David, they're far back in the cave. Now, this is amazing. I mean, if I'm David, I'm thinking, this is too easy. You know, not only, <laughs> not only do I get to embarrass him, but I can kill him. I can take his crown, proclaim victory, go live in the power. God brought me my enemy. I got this. There's only one problem. That's not what God told him to do. David respected the position. And David was serious about waiting for God to promote him. Uh, Psalm 75, 7 says, it is God who promotes. God decides who's going to rise and fall. That's Psalm 75, 7. And then, and then the same type of situation happened a few chapters later, 1 Samuel chapter 26. This time David's in a place called the desert of Ziph. Saul and his 3,000 man army come again. And, and this time night falls. Saul and his men are sleeping. Uh, David, David grabs one of his guys, I think it was Abishai, and uh, walks, walks right into the camp. They're all sleeping. Walks right into the camp. Saul is there sleeping. His spear stuck in the ground next to him. He's got his water jug, water jug next to him. And I love, I love Abishai, what he says. He says, David, today God has delivered him. God has delivered your enemy into his hands. Let me pin him to the ground. I'll just do it with one thrust of my spear. I won't have to strike him twice, just one time, and he's done. And David says this, don't do it. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? I'm not going to be guilty. As surely as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish, but God forbid that I should lay a hand on him. It's integrity, folks. That's integrity. So David was willing to wait for God to make him king. David says, listen, I'm not going to murder somebody so that I can get a position. God told me I'm going to be king. God will make me king. I don't have to make this happen. 
I, I don't have to bring about God's plan for my life. God can bring about God's plan for my life. And so here's what we learn from David. Waiting is a test of our integrity, especially among unbelievers. And so we need to keep focused, keep focused on the Lord. We can't compromise our integrity. Okay. Now let's go to the New Testament. Look at, a, look at this beautiful event in the life of the Apostle Paul. And then, we'll, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. If you don't know who Paul is, uh, Paul is, is, is just out planting churches. He, he was out killing Christians. Uh, Jesus appeared to him. Uh, he gives his life to Jesus, begins to follow Jesus, begins to uh, start planting churches. And uh, just amazing man, amazing uh, work that he did. Uh, and as he's out sharing Jesus, planting churches, making disciples, telling people about Jesus, they're moving, they're hustling, they're bustling, they're traveling, going into all kinds of new territory. And then all of a sudden, bam, God stops them and they're forced to wait. That's what we see here in Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6. It says, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Okay, so this, is, this, this uh, passage of scripture has always intrigued me. You know, they're doing a good work. They're preaching the gospel. They're sharing Jesus and verse, verse 7, or verse 6 rather, says they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Forbidden by the Holy Spirit. And it says it again. They, so they, they were, uh, for, they, they, God didn't allow them to go one direction, so they turned to go the other direction. And verse 7 says the Spirit did not permit them. And so it's, it's always intrigued me. I wonder what this forbidding is. This, this Holy Spirit that, that is, is not, tell how did this happen? How did this really look? If you would have been there with Paul, what would you have heard, seen, experienced? It's interesting. Well, there's, there's a, the scripture doesn't tell us, and so we can only guess, but there's some educated guesses. One, one might be that it could have simply been circumstantial. Paul may have gotten sick or someone else may have gotten sick, um, although maybe they then should have just waited and then gone on, so maybe that's not it. Maybe there were some other circumstances. Maybe it had to do with, with finances or maybe a border crossing and they couldn't get into a certain province. I mean, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, it could have been a prophetic word. That seems likely. Somebody had a word from the Lord, uh, maybe, maybe uh, just a prophecy. Uh, maybe the Lord appeared to them. We don't know. I think, though, and, and this is just speculation on my part, I think it was a lack of peace. I think it was a lack of the peace of God. And that they were going one direction. They said, you know, something just doesn't feel right. It was like a spiritual impression. Just like, I don't feel, I don't, I don't sense. Uh, it's just my, I just don't have this peace. This peace of God, it's important for us to consider. Uh, Colossians 3.15 says it this way. And these are the words of Paul. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Now leave that up there for a minute. I want to show you something here. Uh, the word rule, we typically think of a king, don't we? Like somebody, a king that's sitting on a throne. But the word rule there uh, in the Greek, it actually means to be an umpire. Think about an umpire in a baseball game. That umpire is ruling whether that's a ball or a strike. They're making a rule. They're, they're making a determination. They're deciding something. So let the peace of Christ act as an umpire in your heart. Do you have peace about this decision? Um, that's what the word, the word rule, to be an umpire, to determine, to decide. So I, I believe this is a, a big uh, key to examine uh, whether it's time to step out in faith or whether it's time to keep waiting. Do you have peace about it? When I, uh, um, I've... I've taken some ventures of faith in my life. We, we moved from South Florida up to Canada uh, to do some church planning. We ended up coming here when we've done things in between. And, and sometimes it always begins 
with what I've come to call um, as a holy restlessness. Just where my heart is just being stirred. And it happens over, over a, a while where you just think something, you know, I just, I just sense that God has something else for us. Just this, the thought just occurred to me, I better say this. This is not happening in my heart or my life. I have no, no restlessness about going anywhere at all. That's not why I'm sharing any of this. I just felt I wanted to say that. I don't want to worry anybody. Um, but it just begins as this holy restlessness. And, this, and then kind of that you realize, if I stay in this situation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my peace. I'm not going to have peace about staying here. I need to go. And, and it could work the other way around. Well, I'm thinking about going. I have this job offer. I have this opportunity. But I really, I really don't have peace about that. that, that and, and what I do sometimes, and what might be helpful for you, if, if I forecast out in my life, okay, if I make this decision and I end up moving there or doing this or having that, whatever it might be, could I see myself having peace in that situation? Do, do, I, do I see a future of peace? Would, would that give me the peace of the Lord in the future? I'm letting, I'm Colossians 3.15, letting the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It's, al- it's always hard to put a finger on it, but it's, it's that peace. And so I think maybe that's um, what happened here, that God uh, did in fact direct Paul not to go to a place where there's a legitimate need. Now certainly there was a legitimate need over there in Asia, And the people to the south needed the gospel. The people to the north needed the gospel. But God told Paul, no. He closed the door just because it was his will. And he was going to send someone else there. Uh, This is instrumental for us to understand that just because there's a need doesn't mean that we're the one to meet it. I mean, I look around, even in our own little community here, there are thousands of needs I would love to meet. And I have to watch myself because we'll start too many ministries and we'll just try to do everything because my heart's burdened for, for so many things. And, and sometimes I just have to say, okay, Pat, just stop. Let's, let's give it some prayer. Let's go slowly. I'd rather kind of what I say sometimes, play the long game. We're here for the long haul, so we have time to have some discernment and to meet some needs. But, but I'll tell you what, you see some things that are happening, you just want to run and grab somebody and, and try to save them from hell honestly. And, uh, and, and so just because there's a legitimate need doesn't mean that, that you're the one to meet it, uh, especially if you don't have peace about it. Um, sometimes I see people that, that have a certain ministry. Let's just use, you know, a, a pro, maybe a pro-life or anti-abortion ministry. And, and I, I'm thoroughly pro-life. But sometimes people, they, they, they feel so called to one particular ministry that they get upset if you don't feel the same passion for them. We had a brother who came here for a short season, and he had a passion to reach Mormons. And and I felt that every time uh, I was around him, that I felt guilty that I wasn't reaching Mormons because I, I felt like he was trying to put his calling upon me and consequently upon the church that we should be out reaching Mormons. And I'm thinking... If you have a call to reach Mormons, praise God, we'll pray for you, we'll, we'll help you, we'll, but, but don't put your calling upon me just because there's a legitimate need. Hundreds of thousands of needs all around us. Paul, Paul did not do a good thing because God wasn't calling him to do it. And then, uh, and then it goes on, check this out, in verse, uh, in verse 9, then, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, so, you know, all of these geographical regions, and there's a lot of different regions mentioned here. Uh, Phrygia, Galatia, Asia, Mysia, Bithynia, Troas, Macedonia, all these regions, it, it's anywhere from one to 200 miles we're talking about. So this is encompassing a long time. I mean, we read it and it seems like, oh, this was probably maybe two or three days. No, this was a long time. And, uh, uh, and what is that? That's a season of waiting, isn't it? Well, we want to go here. We can't go there. We need to wait. We want to go there. We can't go there. We need to wait. Well, what do we do? I don't know. Let's go down there. And all that journey, it's, 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 a, it's a season of waiting. And then, and then what was... 
what was the open door? Well, it started with this vision. Um, they ended up going to Macedonia, uh, which then led to them starting churches in Philippi, Thessalonic, Thess Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, Ephesus. Amazing success. All of these churches, and, and we can read, read all about that. But there's one word that you have to see here that is so in, incredibly helpful. And that is a word in verse 10 that says this, concluding, concluding. They'd seen the vision. Immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So what is that? Well, that's a, that's a thinking word. Right, that's a logic word. That's like we're, we're processing this all mentally and we're making a conclusion, we're making a decision. The, the word actually means cause to coalesce. You know, putting things together, they coalesce. Uh, put together in one's mind, knit together, compare, gather. You see, what, it, what happened here is, is a community insight because you see Paul's not by himself. There's, there's, uh, there's other people with him. He had a whole team. So I believe that, that what's happening here and what really pushed the envelope for them to make this decision is that they've taken this, this lack of peace that they had, the knowledge of God's word, this, this vision, this word from the Lord that they had, this conversation, this, this, and this, they, they put this all together, they knit it together, they coalesced, and they came to a conclusion. That's really helpful for us. <clears throat> because it helps us to know when we should wait or when we should move. Um, let me just conclude by saying a couple things. I've kind of tricked you a little bit because I've posed the question, do we wait or do we move? But the answer is we do both at the same time. You see, if we're waiting for God to do something in one area of our life, we should still be moving in another area of our life. Uh, let's say uh, we're, we're waiting for God to do something in our career. Well, we still are serving God in another area in our church. If we're waiting for God to move in, in maybe some relational conflict, uh, we're still pursuing, we're still moving in another area. Oswald Chambers says it like this. Uh, there are not three stages in spiritual life, worship, waiting, and work. Some of us go in jumps like spiritual frogs. We jump from worship to waiting and from waiting to work. God's idea is that the three should go together. They were always together in the life of our Lord. Waiting, working, and worship. So if we put, if we put all of this together, Abraham, Moses, David, and Paul, if we put all of, all of this together, I think here's what we'll find. Uh, number one, we do something. You have to be doing something. Remember evangelism or discipleship. You've you got you to be on mission. You've got to have a calling. You gotta be, if you don't have a calling, just do whatever's put before you. Just, just find something and do it. Find something and do something for God. You can't steer a car unless it's moving. I think when you look at Abraham, Moses, David, Paul, they're all doing something. They're all busy following God. Uh, number two, do it with others. Uh, knowing whether to wait or to take action is easier if you're doing it in community. Uh, we see this especially with Paul, but also Abraham, Moses, David. They, also, they had people with them. They had men with them. Uh, number three, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Uh, the last thing you want to do, if the Holy Spirit is closing a door, the last thing you want to do is go through that door because you'll get a headache. And so you want to look at things like circumstances. And you, you want to be sensitive to the peace that you have. John chapter 10, 27 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's you. You're the sheep of Jesus. You know his voice. Uh, number four, we need to pay attention to the word of God. Pay attention to the word of God. Abraham heard from God. Moses heard from God. David heard from God. Paul received a vision, which is a word from God. We have something better than that. We have the written word of God right here. So we need to allow this to inform us about whether we're waiting or whether we're taking action. 
But listen, in, in, in the final analysis of all of this, it's really about spiritual maturity. It's really about walking closely with Jesus. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, says it this way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So we offer our bodies. Lord, I'm yours. Everything I am, everything I have, everything I'm not. Uh, That verse goes on to say, verse 2, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so we'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We continue growing in the Lord. And that happens as you have a daily quiet time, as you're spending time reading the Bible every day, underlining verses in your Bible that speak to you, writing in your journal, jotting things down that God is telling you, being in a community, whether that's a 242 group or one of the other ministries at church here, just being in a community, talking about your life and listening to others talk about their lives and doing life together, that's how you know what to do, whether you are supposed to keep waiting on the Lord or whether it's time to step out in faith. Father, thank you for our time tonight. Thank you for your word and how it speaks to us, how it helps us. Lord, we all have decisions to make. I pray that you would um, just continue to lead and guide us as we go through life, wanting to glorify you and wanting to live for you and wanting to honor you. Thank you for tonight, Lord. I pray that as we make our way back to uh, our homes or wherever we're going, that we would be aware of your presence and that we would look for opportunities to share your love with other people Uh, today, tomorrow, the rest of this week. Uh, We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.